Hi, I'm Amy Willis with Adam Smith Works, part of the Liberty Fund Network. Hi, I'm Jonathan White, uh, Professor of Economics at the University of Richmond. Professor White, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I feel really pleased to reconnect. Likewise. So as listeners may know, uh, last month we hosted an online reading group based on your novel, Saving Adam Smith. We've collected some questions from some of the folks who participated in that group, and I may have a couple general questions as well um, that we'd like to answer, like to pose to you so you can answer them for our group. If you're ready to get started, we'll go ahead. Let's do it. All right. So let's start at the very beginning, as it were. You are an academic economist. Why did you get interested in Adam Smith? Well, I've got to say the Liberty Fund is a huge part of the reason why I changed my career in the mid-1990s. Uh, when I came out of grad school, I was doing economic development work, and I loved it. It was great. Um, and then one day, I know, I remember the exact day. It was in 1995. And it was in the evening and I'm leaving work. I decided to go to a Borders bookstore. And, I'm, and of course, I'm just perusing the econ section to see what's there. And there was this lovely little paperback version. Uh, in fact, I think I still have it right here. Cool. Uh, no, that's the wrong one. Oops, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the essays on philosophical subjects by Adam Smith. And but that was I in a Borders. No, I'm oh. trying to find my, <laughs> <laughs> my theory of moral sentiments okay. version, but it was a similar paperback version. And, you know, I'd, I'd heard of the theory of moral sentiments, but I didn't know anything about it. And I did have a copy of The Wealth of Nations, of course, which I had barely cracked in grad school. But I thought, wow, this is a nice paperback version of the theory of moral sentiments. It'll look good on my bookshelf and next to the Wealth of Nations. And so I bought it. It was $7.50, I think. So Liberty Fund was, I think, I presume, heavily subsidizing the production of these books to get them out. And it sort of reminded me of when I was in college, the Communist Party in China was heavily subsidizing the works of Mao Zedong. And I would buy those, too, because they're like a dollar to get you know, the, the essays of Mao Zedong. But anyway, I went home with the theory of moral sentiments. It was about nine o'clock at night when I got home. And I was tired and I thought, well, I'll just read it a little bit. But what do I know about philosophy? Nothing, although I'm always interested in philosophy, but I didn't know much. And, um, and I thought it was gonna be a pretty boring book, truthfully. So I opened up the theory of moral sentiments. And I start to read and I'm just captivated. I can't believe it. This stuff is it's, it's explosive. And I hadn't encountered anything like it in my economics training. And I really literally couldn't put it down. And then I went back to campus the next day and I had a colleague, Clarence Jung, who was very interested in philosophy and was interested in Adam Smith. And we put, a, put together a reading group on campus and the, we got the dean to buy, um, or maybe it was the provost, I can't remember, but basically we had a reading group of 12 faculty from all across campus, different disciplines, and we bought everybody a copy of the Liberty Fund Theory of Moral Sentiments, and we got to work, and we spent a year going through the book. Wow. And luckily there were some colleagues from philosophy and religion and other areas who actually knew something about the Enlightenment and were such a valuable resource to us. And so then, um, that was in 95, and then I had a sabbatical coming up in 97, so I proposed to my dean that I wanted to spend that time out in Silicon Valley, um, and I wanted to write a book on Adam Smith, and, and particularly the ethics of Adam Smith. And the dean brought me in and he said, you know, you're an economist. Why are you wasting your time on ethics? And I said, well, because I think it's really important. And I think economists should know about this. Anyway, a couple of years later, after the Enron crisis, after I'd written my book in the Enron crisis, that same dean called me in and said, 
you know, would, would introduce me to other people in the public to say, see, we're doing ethics here in the business school. <laughs> Anyhow, so that's how I got involved with Adam Smith and it's the Liberty Fund that I give a huge thumbs up to for making this available in such a high quality format. And I've, I've since, of course, bought the whole collection. Excellent. Thanks. That's a, that's a nice endorsement. <laughs> um, I have maybe some questions about your career as an economist, as you talked about, but I want to ask first, so when you undertook this particular project with Smith, why fiction? Uh, what, what led you to choose that sort of genre and to, to craft the project the way that you did? Well, first of all, I wanted to write a book that I thought would be engaging to students. And most books that I had read on Smith by that time, by 97 or so, when I was really getting into this project, most of the books I'd read on Smith and moral sentiments were great books. I mean, a lot of really fine quality stuff out there, but it's not really approachable or applicable to students. It's not something that students can use. At least I didn't think it was. And I was also... Um, impressed by Russ Roberts's book, The Choice, where he engaged, um, you know, with fiction mm -hmm. to talk about international trade, David Ricardo, comparative advantage. And I found that to be a very successful book. I'd used it in my principal's classes many times. So Russ uh, ultimately became one of the editors on my project, on my book, to help me think, think it through. So I was impressed by what Russ did and I wanted to do something similar. You're probably, I'm sure you're aware that there've been a lot of other fiction books in economics. Um, and I've enjoyed them, but I didn't think they were very successful with the content. They tended to be too light mm. and they, they tended to not really engage deeply with the material. So. I didn't want to write a light novel on Smith. I wanted to have it be a deeper novel. So I hope I have some sort of balance between I'm deeply into the subject and yet I have made it a format that would be engaging, I hope, to students or to people who are just interested without any background knowledge in economics. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you wanted to share that initial feeling you had when you cracked open TMS for the first time, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, now, as far as there being a lot of economic novels, I think a lot might be a bit of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, what is it about economics that you think lends itself well to fiction? And I suppose by the same token, are there things in economics that you think do not lend themselves well to fiction or being fictionalized, I should say? No, I would say fiction is important because it involves the imagination and through that imagination, we can excite our, um, our moral imagination, really. And it can engage our emotions. And there's a famous Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire. You're probably aware of him. I am. And um, he was considered a Marxist and he was considered a bad guy because he would have, he was trying to teach peasants to read and the books he was writing for peasants are very different than the Dick and Jane. He said the Dick and Jane books, which I would, let's just talk, call them the typical econ textbook, are pretty dull and dry and boring compared to the kinds of lessons he would prepare if he's teaching peasants to read. And he would say, look at the big mansion on the hill. The, the, big <laughs> the manor owner has all the money and he's exploiting you and, you know, that's gonna get people's emotions engaged and they wanna keep reading. Now, actually the first econ textbook I ever had uh, was, um, and I've forgotten the name, but it was in high school, um, The Worldly Philosophers by- Heilbrunner. Heilbrunner, yes. And I thought he did a great job engaging our emotions. Um, so it wasn't fiction, but it used a lot of intriguing emotional hooks. And my first actual textbook was Samuelson, um, his textbook, and he used a lot of emotional hooks as well. So I don't think it's a big stretch to then say, I'm gonna engage other elements that engage the emotions as a way to get students to keep turning the pages. That's great. Um, 
as you as you know, um, but as listeners may or may not know, I used to teach high school economics, and I taught with both Heilbronner uh, and this particular book, so that's fun. Um, I agree with you about Heilbronner. Um, also, we can talk about Freire another time. I think the first chapter is one of the best things I've ever read on education. After that, it changes a little bit. Um, in any case, let's get back to your book, because that's more exciting. Let's talk about some of the characters in your book. Um, were there models that you used for some of those characters, Rich and Harold, of course, in particular, but any others that you want to mention? Inevitably, I know that um, authors say you only really know how to write about yourself. Uh, so the main character, Rich, is some convoluted um, person. I'm sure there are many characteristics of myself in that character. Um, I wouldn't say it's my life biography by any stretch of the imagination because in some ways I'm very different from that character. But, you know, I think it draws upon things that I know about. Um, the main character, uh, Harold, is roughly based on a roommate I had who was an older roommate. And so physiologically, I would say he's similar. Um, and also in terms of his personality, or I, I drew from that. Um, other characters include my wife, who shows up uh, in the book. Um, and my wife had a lot of suggestions, some of which were excellent and some of which I did not adopt. <laughs> For example, my wife says, you got to have a lot of sex in here. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to sell more copies, I guess, but I didn't think it would be appropriate for, for this audience to do that. So the graduate school advisor um, was, was based on a composite of some of the bad advisors that we all hear about in grad school. It's certainly not my own graduate advisors who I loved and I thought did a great job and really helped me a lot. But I wanted to create tension and I wanted to create kind of a more um, hostile relationship in some ways, because I think a lot of students in grad school have had advisors who have done bad things um, to them. For example, foisting their own research projects on them and forcing them to work at slave wages on their research projects. I, maybe that's a thing that is uh, an artifact of the 60s and the 70s, and maybe that no longer exists in grad school. I hope grad school students have a little more power than they did back when I went to grad school. But there was um, a grad school professor at my school who was really uh, mean and horrible to his grad school students. But he was the only one working in a particular area. So if you wanted to work in that area, you had to work for him. And he knew that. And he had monopoly power. Interesting. All right. Let's talk about uh, things that made it into the book that maybe shouldn't have. You yourself <laughs> shared uh, in, our, in our Facebook group one time, I'm talking about the poker scene in the book, of course, with, uh, with yeah. Smith and Rousseau and company. And you said yourself in the Facebook group that one of your editors uh, rather strenuously tried to get you to keep that scene out of the book. So we want to know, of course, what made you keep it in? Uh, what, why did you think that was important? And how did you sort of win that battle, as it were? Well, I, I think I, I wouldn't say that I was right and the editor was wrong or vice versa. I would say the editor was trying to do a good job compressing my book a little bit. Um, and when you compress something a little bit, you make it easier for faculty members to say, oh, this is something I could assign and reasonably have students get it done sooner rather than later. And, but as, as the book gets a little wider and a little more deeper into the subject, then it's harder for the professor to justify assigning it sometimes. But I didn't want to I didn't want to water it down. That was really my main pushing back against this person was to say, I thought the context for knowing about the enlightenment was important. I didn't want to think that Adam Smith exists in some vacuum and that 
he alone comes up with these ideas and he's so brilliant and these ideas appear out of nowhere and they were never affected or altered by anything. And I wanted to avoid that. I, I wanted to avoid the, the notion that history happens in a vacuum, that ideas pop out of nowhere. So I put that scene in there um, explicitly to try to bring in uh, Rousseau and Voltaire and David Hume to set the context for Smith, who, by the way, borrowed heavily from all of these people. And so I know that it may have, to some extent, cost me readership if some faculty member said, oh, this isn't something I'm interested in, or I can't directly relate it to an econ concept. But, but I, I want our students to be critical thinkers. I want our students to think outside the box. I want to stretch them. And so I made that choice to stick it in. I hope it worked. Well, we're all very glad that you kept it in. And what a fun way to provide the sort of context that you're talking about for Smith. You know, uh, we, we call ourselves Adam Smith Works, so obviously we're uh, big fans of Smith himself. Um, but we would agree with you. It's really important to take him in the context of the larger Enlightenment, uh, and even larger than the Scottish Enlightenment itself, right? I mean, to have, mm -hmm. have the Voltaires and the Rousseaus and, and that, that whole... Um, that, that whole scheme of folks. Uh, one of the other books we read together recently was The Club uh, about uh, mm. Johnson and Boswell's club, like the club, uh, which Smith was a part of. Um, and so we've been very interested in this larger context. Um, here's a question uh, that's more related to today. So we're, we're anxious to hear that. And then we might have a couple more procedural questions about writing the book. Um, one of our readers, Caroline, says that your novel focuses on saving Adam Smith in the sense of rescuing his ideas um, from some sort of misrepresentation or perhaps just from you know, not being paid attention to. How might Adam Smith save us during this time of turmoil? How might his theories help us to respond properly to the conflicts that our countries are undergoing right now? And what do you think he might tell Rich today? Wow, that's a great question. It's a big one, yeah. <laughs> it's a huge one. And I think it starts with TMS. It starts with opening ourselves up to listen, not with the intent that we're going to talk over the other person or try to convince the other person of our point of view, but we're really listening to engage and reach a place of fellow feeling. So for example, and I'm, I'm not the first person to come up with this, and I've been doing some reading that others have suggested, which is, suppose you have a family member, as I do, who we disagree profoundly about current political events. Um, how do we connect with each other? How do we stay in, in touch with each other? And, and one part of me naturally wants to talk over the other person, convince them the rightness of my ideas and all the, here are all the facts, but I don't think that's how you engage with other people in a way that's productive. You engage with other people by finding a place of commonality, a place of fellow feeling. And that starts with asking the other person, well, tell me what you're feeling and tell me why you're feeling what you're feeling. And we can agree that we both might feel fear, anger, we're being threatened, and then to really get into that space with that person. And it's from that place of shared commonality and shared moral sentiments that we then can start to have a conversation about ways forward. And it might mean that this person that I, in my family, that I don't see perfectly eye to eye with, uh, it might mean we're never going to see eye to eye but we can continue to have a conversation and I can continue to honor those feelings in her of fear and anger and so on. And so I think Smith really holds a key to unlocking a way to have dialogue in a respectful way with people who you disagree with. And by the way, um, I do a seminar twice a year for 
police, um, uh, kind of in a police academy in Virginia. And there are people in Virginia doing empathy training as a way to de-escalate the violence. Wow. And it starts with obviously listening. And it's, it's a two-way street for sure. There are a lot of people who are attacking police who do not bother or don't want to listen, who want to put police into a box of being evil and bad. So it really is to me a two-way street. We need to have police listening rather than simply attacking. And we need to have the population, the public listening and trying to engage. But I think Adam Smith's theory of moral sentiments, you know, there's so many wonderful quotes from Adam Smith, uh, which if we had another 10 minutes, I'd go look them up on TMS, but it's, it's, you know, one quote is, if you have no conception of what I'm experiencing, then I am thoroughly angry and I, I can't even, ex you know, have you in my presence without feeling outraged. And it's just really insightful stuff about why people can't see eye to eye and why, why people might be outraged with each other is because we can't even, I don't even get a sense that you can understand what I'm, what I'm experiencing. Do you use Smith's texts in groups such as that? Absolutely. That's amazing. That's a great story. Um, followers of the site might also know uh, we've, we've done a recent Read With Me series, and I'll be interviewing another author later this week, Sam Fleischacker, um, who is okay. a philosopher and has written a new book about empathy. And one of the things he talks about is uh, the importance of imagination, which you mentioned, uh, in terms of get, being able to see oneself in someone else's shoes, and in particular, how important fiction and literature is for helping to engage that imagination or, or to, to foster that process so people can take a moment to think what it might be like to be in the other person's position. Um, any thoughts of a follow-up to this book? <laughs> I, I know there are a few errors in my book in, in terms of, uh, I think I have the, um, on one occasion when we're talking about time zones and time in California versus time in Virginia, I got, I got something a little confused. And I know there are some other issues. And certainly if I were to write a second edition of the book, I would um, bring out more information that I've since learned about the invisible hand. And it's not the invisible hand of the textbooks at all. I, I think I'm on pretty good ground to say the invisible hand is only mentioned once in the Wealth of Nations and once in Theory of Moral Sentiments, but it really permeates all of the Theory of Moral Sentiments in all of the uh, instincts, the call to nature, the power of nature that Adam Smith refers to over and over and over again in TMS. And I would want to bring out some of that. I'm not sure how much I'd want to add, maybe a page or two, but I'd want to do a better job because I think in TMS, the invisible hand I've used is the standard textbook treatment, which I think now is very misleading, unfortunately. It, it implies to the invisible hand the idea that the invisible hand is somehow about economic efficiency, which, by the way, is a 20th century concept that has nothing to do with what Smith came up with. So I would do a better job on that. I did for a while ponder writing an economic novel about Keynes and I would bring Keynes back to life. And I think it would be an exciting thing to do, but it would take way more time than I have available at this point. So I, I pretty much have abandoned that idea. Maybe there's one of your listeners out there who'd want to take it on and I could send you all of my notes. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, that would be really cool to have that. I don't know. Yeah. All right, well, Professor White, thank you so much for taking the time to answer our questions today. We really appreciate you and we all really enjoyed your book. Um, the, the teacher who ran the discussion uses it in her classes and I suspect that this coming fall you might see some more classrooms uh, using your book to learn more about Smith. So thanks very much. Amy, thank you so much. And of course, if any teacher is out there and would